right, hello, welcome everybody uh, to our text mining techniques webinar. We'll go ahead and get started here. A um, couple introductions. My name is Scott Fincher. Um, I'm a data scientist on our education and evangelism team here at NIME. Um, my job at NIME is to help people to use our software better, basically. It's one of my jobs. Um, then also with me today is Dr. Durson Dellen. Durson, you want to introduce yourself right quick? Yes, Scott. Hi, everyone. I'm Durson Dillon. I'm a uh, professor of management science and information systems at Oklahoma State University. Um, I have been in analytics for over 30 years, started writing pricing models in 1988 and continue on my journey. Um, I did applied artificial intelligence and operations research methods combined together in my dissertation. And I worked five years in industry conducting applied analytics projects, although in the back days we did not call it analytics, but basically that's exactly what we did. And in the last 19 years plus, I've been a faculty member uh, conducting research projects, applied consultants type of projects, writing papers and textbooks in the field of analytics and data science. So back to you, Scott. Perfect. So um, a little bit about how things are gonna go today. So if you have uh, questions as we go, just use the Q&A section to post your questions. I'll show you on the next slide where that is located. Um, this session is gonna be recorded and um, you know, we're gonna post it later on YouTube. If we don't have time to get to your question, um, which is maybe possible, we have a lot of participants today, um, we'll send a follow-up email and also a link on our forum where we're gonna make sure that all the questions get answered. We don't wanna leave any stones unturned here. So if you do have questions, um, just look at the bottom of your Zoom. You see this little Q&A button. You can click that. It'll open up um, a different window where you can type your question. Other folks can, if it's something they're interested in as well, they can upvote it. And so we can see which ones are kind of the most popular or maybe um, need to be uh, more urgently addressed. And we'll get to those questions at the end. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? in the hour that we have. So first I'll do a very brief intro to NIME software because there's almost certainly some folks on this call who aren't that familiar with NIME. So we'll give you a little bit of background about NIME. Um, we'll talk a little more specifically about the text processing extension we use in NIME since we need that for anything that we're gonna be doing today. And then Durson's gonna talk to you about some general text mining concepts and also the text mining process itself. I'll present to you some different sentiment analysis methods uh, using a movie review data set. And then Durson's gonna talk to you about topic detection with the LDA algorithm uh, on a slightly different movie data set, but everything that we're presenting today is kind of movie themed. And then at the end, we'll have some additional resources for you and time for some questions, I hope. So let's go ahead and get started with an intro to NIME. So you face these different challenges when you're operationalizing data science. Uh, you've got you know, all these different technologies you may need to implement. Folks on your team have different skills and resources. You need to take it into account the data scientist requirements. You wanna make sure that you're mainstreaming this across your organization and that you have a good high quality delivery system. And that's what we try to provide you with our NIME software in a single ecosystem. So what we see on the left-hand side here is the NIME analytics platform, which is mostly what we're going to be talking about today. This is going to help you to uh, import your data, do all your data wrangling in ETL, create your models uh, and visualization. Uh, and we have not only just the analytics platform itself, but also several extensions and integrations that are freely available. Um, one of which is the text processing extension, which we'll be discussing today. So the NIME Analytics platform is uh, free to download. Uh, it's open source software. So anybody can just go to our website, download and try it out. But a question we often get is, hey, that's nice. You guys make software freely available to download. How do you make any money and keep the lights on? And so that's where we have a complementary piece of software called the NIME server. Um, this is what we sell to enterprise customers. It's gonna help you deploy and manage different workflows across your data science team, um, help you optimize things a little bit better and really just get things uh, up and running at a production level. Uh, there's also the web portal that's available um, and some options for, for data science as a service. So we won't really be talking about the commercial product, the NIME server today, but in case you're not aware, I just wanted you to know that it's there. 
So let's talk about uh, NIME itself, NIME Analytics Platform. When we go into the demos and we start seeing the software, what are we going to be looking at? So NIME is a GUI-based tool that allows you to build workflows graphically. You can you know, import data, build models, uh, generate visualizations, all without writing any code. And to do that, we have these little colored boxes called nodes. Each node is going to perform some individual task on a data. So here's our group by node, which is going to do some you know, aggregating, for example. We can combine these different nodes in various ways to make a workflow. Um, the workflow is going to build out your entire process. So here, maybe I'm reading in some data. Uh, I, I'm going from left to right here. Uh, build out some visualizations. And then in this case, if I'm building a model, I do some partitioning to split the data and then uh, feed it to a decision tree learner to train a model. Uh, it's associated predictor to do the predictions based on that model and then some validation of how the model's performing. So it's just a real simple example. How might I read in some data and build a model? You might have some workflow that looks like this. We'll see more of these later. Uh, something else that NIME offers is something called a component. A component is a way to encapsulate these different nodes, basically wrap them up into a single node, um, kind of like a function in a programming language. So um, I could take you know, this entire set of nodes here I have in the middle and collapse them down into a component. This one says document preprocessing, right? So in terms of text analytics, maybe inside of this component, I have things like stop word filtering or tagging, um, other things that might be relevant to pre-processing. The idea here is that I can, can encapsulate this and reuse it later so that I'm not having to constantly reinvent the wheel and um, start from scratch with building my workflows. So there's a whole bunch of different nodes. I won't go into all of this. It says 2,000 plus nodes. We're actually over 3,600 now, I think, um, to cover all sorts of things from reading data in to doing ETL, um, data blending, uh, building models with all sorts of different types of algorithms, visualization, and deployment. And then since NIME is an open source tool, we like to play nice with other open source technologies where we can as well. So you'll see all sorts of different types of nodes to do things like um, reading in data from flat files or Twitter, for example, um, using REST APIs. If I want to uh, you know, build out uh, models in Keras and TensorFlow. We'll show you an example just briefly of that in a little bit. Or if I want to use existing R and Python code, I have nodes to do that. Uh, likewise, for reporting and visualization, we have the ability to push information out to Power BI and Tableau if you're uh, more comfortable using those. Or you can use our integrated Plotly nodes to generate some nice visualizations. Um, there's also some big data functionality as well. So just so that you know that um, NIME's open, we try to play nice uh, with other technologies, and there's a lot of these different functionality that are integrated uh, via different extensions that are available to you. Uh, if you're just getting your feet wet with NIME, or if you've been using NIME for a while and you'd like to be more effective, two things I'd like to point you to that are very helpful in your NIME journey. One is the NIME community, our forum at forum.nime.com. Um, you can go there uh, if you have questions about how does this node work or why is my workflow uh, not doing what I think it should uh, post in our forum we have folks there um, several you know of our nine team members post there I myself in there almost every day um, but also several experts from our community that are willing to help you troubleshoot and understand uh, what's going on with your workflows better and another thing that's really nice on the left hand side here is the hub hub.nime.com if you go to the hub, and in fact, let me just pull that up right quick. Um, if you go to the hub, it looks like this. I can search for different nodes and workflows. In particular, if you were to search for this keyword, text mining webinar, all one word, here you can find all of the different workflows that we're actually going to be talking about today. So if you want to try these out later uh, to be able to play with them, they come with the data, um, go out to hub.nime.com and search for uh, the text mining webinar keyword. Um, but we'll also send links to this afterwards so it's available to you. So I just wanted you to be aware of the hub. Okay, the nine text processing extension itself, really important because everything that we're gonna be showing you today um, relies on this extension. Uh, if you don't have it installed already, you actually can install it from the hub. Uh, you can search for the text processing extension and click on this little box on the right hand side. You can drag and drop that into a workflow that you might have to install the text processing extension. You'll also be prompted if you don't have it installed the first time you try and open one of these workflows, you'll be prompted by NIME to install it. 
And you can also, if you're familiar with NIME, you can install it the old fashioned way um, just by going through the menu system in NIME. Once you've installed it, you're going to have access to a whole bunch of different nodes that aren't available in your just regular NIME uh, installation. Things like um, you know, the bag of words creator or uh, ways to create document vectors or um, all sorts of different nodes for pre-processing and visualization specific to text analysis. So these are all the nodes that come in with the text processing extension. So I just point that out because if you want to try this stuff later, you'll need it uh, to be able to run the workflows we're going to show you. Having said that, let me step aside for a minute and let Derson talk to you about text binding concepts. Thank you, Scott. I am going to share my screen, pick up where you left off, and then talk about some general foundational information about text mining, kind of demystifying what text mining is, how it differs from data mining, why do we need it, why is it so popular? So we're gonna to try to answer some of those questions. And most of the concepts that I'm gonna to talk to you about um, are coming from these textbooks and some of the articles and white papers and tutorials that we authored, co-authored in the recent past. So if you uh, look at literature, you will see a lot of names roughly implying the same thing, tax mining, tax analytics, tax processing. There's a lot of overlap uh, and a lot of buzzwords um, around converting text into actionable insight. Information retrieval, information extraction, NLP, a subcomponent of uh, applied AI, computational linguistic, among others. So all of those are seemingly different terminology, different buzzwords, but they all in essence, lead to extracting knowledge, actionable insight from textual data, but they're not exactly the same. So we put them all together, sort of, under a taxonomy, a pictorial form, and the highest level is the text analytics in this pictorial representation within which you have text mining that leverages a lot of the functionalities of the web mining, which within itself has the content mining, structure mining, usage mining, as well as data mining, which is classification clustering and association type of patterns that we often mine in text mining, along with on the other side, left hand side, we have information retrieval and NLP. All of those are foundational constructs that collectively gives us the mechanisms to activate and to process text mining, process textual content. And the foundational disciplines that feeds into enabling this is is basically machine learning, statistics, management science, AI, computer science, and, and, and other disciplines. So it itself is not a discipline, but it consumes and builds on the foundational disciplines that we have uh, built over the years. So why text mining? Why is it so popular in recent years? The, the, the reason being is that a vast majority of the corporate data is in some kind of unstructured form, a textual form, right? And this textual data is doubling every 18 months, according to some of the industry experts. And tapping into these information sources and converting them into actionable insight, information and knowledge is not an option, but it's a necessity to stay competitive, to stay uh, viable in the, the in the global marketplace. So the solution is basically the tax mining, tax analytics, tax processing, which is basically a semi-automated process of extracting, right, discovering knowledge and information from large collections of unstructured textual data uh, resources. It's also described and labeled text data mining or knowledge discovery in textual databases. So there's quite a few names and if you look at the tax mining, especially popular in disciplines in areas where there is a tremendous amount of textual content accumulated over uh, the years, for instance, uh, in law, court orders, kind of automatically shuffling through court orders to find evidences that you need to make your own case stronger. Academic research has been a very popular area of tax mining applications, kind of mining literature, and we'll have a short case study that we're going to talk about this article, the literature mining financial area, along with the quarter reports that the companies put out. You can also tap into 
discussion boards, uh, social media, and kind of combine those textual content to make some insight or generate some insight out of it. In medicine, biology, technology, marketing, they all are very textually rich domains that take good um, advantage of, uh, of text mining. From financial side, from productivity side, probably the, the, the field that benefited most out of text mining is, is customer relationship management for over the years, right? And we all are quite familiar with how text mining is used in electronic communication records, basically in emails by spam filtering and email placing categorization and even automatic response generation. So text mining, when you dig into it a little bit, you realize that it has its own lingo, its own terminology. It's like a totally different language, right? A lot of these words you may not be familiar with if you have never done text mining. So the collection of documents that we put together, we call it corpus. In plural of that, we call it corpora. Now, when I say unstructured data, most of you might think, why is it unstructured? Because if it was unstructured, there would not be any meaning of it. So. The idea behind the keyword unstructured is that it's not structured for computers to automatically process. So unstructuredness kind of relates to how it resonates computers for automatic processing. It is structured for human consumption. So the, the data that we usually consume in computers comes in tables, rows and columns, well-structured, first, second, third normal form, and what have you. But textual data is not in that kind of format for computers to easily process. So we need to do a lot of quote unquote pre-processing on the textual data to convert into a language, a representation for computers to be able to automatically process it. And during that process, we look at the, the, the lowest level of constructs, words, the terms, concepts, and topics. We take those words and terms and we kind of simplify them. We kind of remove the suffixes, prefixes, and inflections out of those words using stemming and lemmatization. One is more syntactically oriented process. The other one is more semantically, more dictionary-driven process to kind of simplify the, the, the term dictionary. Um, we use stop words, kind of exclude the words that we don't need, and, or we can actually include only the words that we want to include and exclude everything else from our collection of words when we're actually processing textual content, synonyms, homonyms, and morphology, all of these are keywords that resonates well with how the text is pre-processed within the context of computational linguistic and natural language processing, right? So at the end, what we're looking for is a structured representation of this textual content that we call term by document matrix. In nine, we're gonna call it document vector and where we're gonna have the rows representing the documents and column representing the features, basically terms, and the intersection of the rows and columns are gonna be some numerical representation of the relationship between the documents and the terms. And then this matrix is gonna be pretty large and sparse, so we're gonna sometimes need to use some dimensional reduction, algorithms like singular value decomposition to reduce it to a smaller size so that we can apply pattern discovery techniques like classification, clustering, and associations on it. And then a good application of text mining always is sentiment analysis, which we're gonna talk about. Um, and then we're gonna also talk about topic modeling, again, a very popular application area of text mining. The latest and greatest uh, dimensions in text mining kind of um, goes into work to work. Again, I don't think we have time to get into it, Along with this, there's also uh, RNN type, uh, LSTM type deep learning algorithms that not only take into account which words are in the document collection, but also the sequence in which the words, act words actually presents themselves in those textual documents. Now let's talk about how we actually do text mining. What is the process? What is the recipe that we follow to ensure successful completion of uh, text mining related analytics projects. So as you all know, in data mining and analytics, there are um, several popular standardized processes, which is basically manifestation of the best practices, right? As to how to do analytics, predictive analytics, 
um, in particular. So Chris DM have been a very popular one because it's cross industry and a lot of the organizations and data scientists have been adopting it. When you look at some of the industry flavored polls that are created in the industry, you will see that crisp DM is dominating all the others collectively. And this crisp DM process, which is six step logical intuitive process, readily applicable to textual content, right? Business understanding, data understanding, data pre-processing, probably the difference is going to be the step two and three, data understanding and data pre-processing, data preparation is going to be a lot more involved than it would be in a data mining and predictive analytics projects. But let's look at it in a more specific um, perspective. Let's look at a very highest level of conceptualization as to what text mining actually do, right? The activity is to extract knowledge from available data sources, and most of which are going to be textual in nature. So the inputs that comes from the left-hand side, by the way, this is a representation concept diagram that comes from IDEF0 um, process modeling tool. So on the left-hand side, we get mostly textual unstructured data, but also some structured data collectively, the raw material for this knowledge extraction process. On the right hand side, the output is the contact specific, domain specific, problem specific knowledge and actionable insight. What comes from the top collectively, we call it controls or limitations or uh, things that keeps us from reaching our goals freely, kind of we need to function within those limitations that includes both software and hardware limitations. Although we have, you know, great algorithms and almost unlimited computational power and storage mechanisms, it's still a limitation when you're talking about very, very large textual databases. Privacy issues, linguistic limitations are still a significant player in how we do and what we do. And what comes from the bottom on this context diagram is the domain expertise in tools and techniques that helps us, the mechanisms collectively that helps us do what we want to do, convert textual content into actionable insight and knowledge. When we take that context diagram and decompose it into the main tasks, we come up with this three task, simple forward progress type of uh, uh, workflow. The first task is to establish the corpus, basically collecting and organizing all the textual and other data sources into a single medium. It could be a single file or it could be a collection of files in a in a, in a folder or a nested collection of folders, all represented in a standardized format so the computer can actually process it. The task two is probably the most time demanding and probably the most art based um, activity that you're going to have to carry out, which is basically taking textual content and creating a structured uh, a future driven representation of it. We call it creating the term by document matrix, right? Once you have that, and what is at the bottom of this slide is basically a snapshot of what might come out of task number two. And on the, the rows, you have the documents. It could be maybe articles, each of which, or it could be a tweets, or it could be a, a customer reviews, or it could be movie reviews that we're gonna talk about uh, in a few minutes. And the columns are the terms and the numbers represent how many times each of those terms occurs in each of those documents. As you might imagine, we might end up having tens of thousands of columns and then various sports metrics that feeds into the task number three, which is extracting knowledge. Basically it's a da data mining process where we do either predictive uh, modeling um, either classification or, or, or regression, or we can do clustering or association type uns unsupervised learning type of pattern extraction from the data. If you look at NIME, the whole process is kind of lined up under a nested folder structure. So when you install text processing, the first folder will help you input output, kind of reading the data in, then you enrich the data, textual data, you transform it, then you pre-process it, then you convert it into numerical feature space, uh, basically document vectors, what you actually create. And then you mine that structured data using different data mining tools and, and pattern 
capturing um, and knowledge discovery um, methods um, in NIME. Now, let me give you a, 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 a quick example of how you can use text mining in, in, in literature. So this particular project, it's quite dated. It was uh, the, the paper that we published on it. It's all the way back to 2008. At that time, text mining was relatively new. And then we wanted to see in the IS literature what people are publishing and whether or not these top three journals in IS field, in information systems field, tend to publish the same thing or do they significantly differ in a way that they actually prefer what topics and what, what, uh, what, what subjects they are more inclined to publish. So we collected uh, 12 years of data articles from all three journals. In total, a little over 900, actually 901 papers we used in this text mining project. Uh, we only used the abstracts of the papers to make things a little easier on the processing side. And then after trying different numbers of clusters, we settled on nine clusters, kind of representing nine relatively different-ish um, topics represented in this um, collection of, of, of articles. So this is a input data. So you have the journal, you have all kinds of information, and the last column, the column that we actually used for text processing was the abstract itself. So first we wanted to see whether or not out of these nine clusters, each of which is a sort of latent topic of some sort, um, whether or not any of the journal tends to be more inclined to publish um, in that particular topic. And then um, you can actually use this information perhaps to um, create a web based this support system where you submit your abstract and then tool might tell you which of these three journals, you can actually expand the, the collection journals to a larger uh, set more likely to positively perceive and perhaps publish your paper. We also wanted to see if these nine clusters have any um, time series patterns embedded in it. So are they getting more popular? Were they popular and kind of tapering off? If you look at cluster number six, it has been quite popular volume wise, how many papers published in that particular um, cluster, but uh, it has a negative sort of slope towards the end. Whereas if you look at class number four, there seems to be a positive trend. That means if you're a PhD student and you want to do your dissertation in immersive systems field, you're more likely to, to choose cluster four because once you graduate three, four years down the road, you want your topic area to be popular for you to have an easier and better chance to, to get a really good academic or, or professional job out there. So this is uh, one of those early applications that we uh, use text mining for literature context. Uh, and then since then, we actually applied it to uh, different scope of medical literature. So you see a lot of application of text mining in medical literature uh, as to how things have evolved and what are the, uh, the trends and then kind of generalizing as to what the future looks like in those specific domains. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over back to Scott to talk about sentiment analysis, one of the most popular text mining areas nowadays. Scott? Okay. Thank you, Derson. So uh, yeah, let's talk a little bit about sentiment analysis. This is kind of a, a fun exercise. Um, what is sentiment analysis? So let's say, for example, um, you have some product reviews. Maybe it's a review of a phone on Amazon. Uh, the Samsung Galaxy S7. So this is a little dated, but you know you might get different reviews with containing different text, right? You know this this guy here, beautiful phone from a wonderful seller. This practically new beautiful phone exceeded my. Ex Obviously, this person's very happy, right? Uh, whereas the guy down here, very bad experience. Um, we know what he thought as well. So when we're looking at text like this, it's obvious to us as a human. Um, how people feel about this, but it's sometimes less obvious to a computer or to a machine. So how can we train models that will do this type of sentiment extraction and analysis for us? There's a few different ways, and we're gonna talk about some of these different ways. Um, what other ways or what other things might you use sentiment analysis for? Um, so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about movie reviews and just simply try and classify them. Is this particular review positive or negative? Um, you also might, you know, try and talk about what we just said, um, 
what do people think about a particular product uh, based on uh, their comments online. Uh, since in the US here, we're in an election year, uh, this is going to be happening more and more. A political uh, application, what do people think about specific candidates or a specific issue, right? We could go pull a bunch of tweets off of Twitter and mine that information to see um, you know, how people are thinking about something in particular. Um, and then once we have this information, then we could maybe do some predictions, right? We Maybe we could try and um, predict election outcomes. Obviously, that's a tough one, but people try to do it. Um, or maybe something a little more specific, like predict market trends uh, based on sentiment on a particular product. So all different things we could do in the realm of sentiment analysis. But what we're going to focus on uh, in the short term here is classification of movie reviews. So we have this data set. It's uh, well known and freely available. You can find it all over the internet. The IMDb large movie review data set. We're actually just going to look at a subset of that. Um, 2,000 different movie reviews. So 1,000 of them classified as positive and 1,000 of them classified as negative. Uh, with the goal here being to assign the correct sentiment label to each document based on the text itself. So um, when you download, if you try out, and I hope you do, you try out these workflows that we're going to go through, this data will be provided with the download, so you don't have to go find it elsewhere. But if you do go looking for it, I think this movie review data set has something like 50,000 reviews in it, the full, the full size data set. So three different ways that we could tackle this particular problem, looking at movie reviews and classifying them as positive or negative. So, the, and we'll kind of go from left to right here, simplest to most complex. So there's a lexicon based approach, which we'll talk about. There's kind of a more standard machine learning approach. And then there's um, the newer, more cutting edge stuff, the deep learning approach. So let's talk about these just briefly before I jump into a, a demo. So in the lexicon based approach, what we're going to be doing is tagging different words that we know are positive and negative based on publicly available corpuses of these types of words. The MPQA corpus, for example, is a list of a whole bunch of English words with positive connotations. So we can take those words and match them up in our movie review looking for positive and negative words. And then what we do is just simply count the number of positive and negative words per document and calculate this kind of index value, which is going to give us the overall positivity or negativity of the entire review. So it's pretty straightforward. It's not really that sophisticated an approach. The advantage to using it, though, is that we don't need um, supervised or labeled data to do this. Um, we don't need to know the answers ahead of time, so to speak, but all we need is the list of positive and negative words, and we can come up with some estimation of whether people liked or did not like the movie. Now we could do something a little more, oh, and I should say this is, uh, here's just a picture of what that looks like, but I'll show you again in a minute uh, in the demo. The second approach that we could take here is to actually use a supervised data set where we have labeled positive and negative movies already, and then do some pre-processing on that data to kind of boil down the feature space to something more manageable uh, and convert that convert those English words into a mathematical sparse matrix representation. And then once we have that mathematical representation of what our reviews look like, then we can use our standard machine learning algorithms, decision tree, logistic regression, random forest, whatever you feel most comfortable with um, to build a model and predict the sentiment. Uh, the advantage here is that uh, although we do have to have the labeled data here, it does perform significantly better than the previous lexicon-based approach. And so here is what the workflow looks like for that, which I'll show again in a second. And then there's a deep learning approach, which I won't spend too much time on. Um, number one, we don't have the time. Number two, it's more complicated. And number three, um, I actually learned today that in July, we're going to have a specific deep learning webinar um, specific to text analysis taught by one of our other data scientists centered around LSTMs. Um, so we have this here so that you can play with it, but if you really are interested in LSTMs and how they work and how you can use them in NIME, um, definitely sign up for our upcoming webinar where we'll do a deep dive on that. Um, but I'll, I'll show you here in a second um, what that workflow looks like and why you might want to use it. So let me just switch over to NIME right quick, show you what this looks like. Um, I won't go in and show you exactly what every node is doing because uh, we just don't have the time to do it. But just to give you a general idea of how things are proceeding, let's look at the lexicon-based approach. So here on the left-hand side, we are reading in some data. 
you can see our orange notes would indicate we're reading something in. In this case, and this has all been pre-executed already, so I can just right click and look at the results of any node. If I want to see what my movie reviews look like, I can call up this table which has an index value, the URL from IMDB where the review came from, then the text of the review itself. And if I scroll all the way over, I can see the sentiment which is pause or neg for positive or negative sentiment, 1000 of each. So this is our supervised data. We already know whether the reviews are positive or negative. Um, can we, you know, build a model or, or come up with a way uh, to find that out ourselves. So whenever we use the NIME text processing extension, one of the first things we do is the strings to document conversion usually to convert things to a document format. Um, a document is a particular type of field or variable in NIME that contains not only the actual text of whatever it is you're trying to analyze, but also some meta information. So things like the author, um, the category, which in this case would be either positive or negative. You can have things like publication date, um, the source, all of that stuff is contained as meta information along with the text you're looking at. So we convert things to a document because all of these subsequent nodes here, not all of them, but a lot of them, require the document uh, type within NIME. So we convert our strings to a document, do a little filtering, and then here is our list from MPQA of our positive and negative words. I have two separate lists, a positive list and a negative list. You can look at the positive list and see things like adaptability and Agilate and Agile, things that are have positive connotations, right? There are about 2,700 words listed in there, and for my negative list, I have almost 5,000 words. And I use the dictionary tagger node to take these input lists and assign them, assign tags to my existing movie reviews and say, okay, if it, if it comes from this list here, I'm going to assign it sentiment positive. And so on, the same thing for the negative words. I do a little bit of pre-processing here to just filter out only the words that are then tagged. I get rid of any of my other words in the entire document that don't have a positive or negative tag. Uh, then I create a bag of words and I use the TF, the term frequency node, just to calculate how often particular terms show up in a given document. So that's what I'm seeing here in my first review, um, document 3617, the word sense, for example, which has a positive connotation is used three times. Utility is used twice and so on and so forth. I'm just counting up the different positive and negative words that show up in these documents. Then I do a little bit of aggregation to count the positive and negative words that show up for each movie review. And then I just calculate the sentiment score, which is basically um, the number of positive words minus the number of negative words divided by the total number of words. It's just a simple index calculation. And then I assign my own positive or negative sentiment based on that score. So once I've done that calculation, then I can compare it to my original um, classification that came in at the very beginning with my reviews, and I can generate a confusion matrix using the scorer node to see how well this performed. It turns out that I'm only about 68% accurate, so this is not a super accurate way of doing the classification, but the nice part, as I mentioned before, is that you don't need to have um, the supervised data to do this prediction, right? You, we're just using a list of positive and negative words, and we still came up with almost 70% accuracy. So that's one way we could approach this. Let's get something a little more sophisticated here. So this is our machine learning approach, where we're going to read in these IMDB reviews, again, convert them to documents. But here we do a lot more enrichment and pre-processing. So uh, this POS tagger node, this is a parts of speech tagging node where we can say, Okay, this word is a noun, this word's an adjective, and so on and so forth. Um, we also do a whole bunch of pre-processing here. Uh, this is stuff that you're typically going to want to do as part of a you know, text analysis, things like erase punctuation, get rid of very small words, um, apply a stop word filter for you know, common words like you know, a and the, between, words that may not have all that much meaning. Um, I can do stemming and limitization here, and then I do filtering at the end for only particular parts of speech. So what's the point of all this? It's to boil down my feature space to make it a little more manageable um, so that I'm not dealing with every single um, word that's within these movie reviews. I'm really looking at stuff that's just going to contain the information I care about, which in this case is how people feel about the movie. So once I've done the pre-processing here, I do some additional transformation. Again, we see a bag of words, um, calculate the term frequencies, and here we use the document vector node. So this is where we do a transformation to convert from English 
you know, human readable space into a mathematical sparse matrix representation of the data. In fact, if I look at what comes out of this document vector node, takes a little while to load, I basically have one row for each movie review. There's 2,000 rows. And then across the top, you see the stemmed words um, of all the different terms in my corpus. So movie, absolute, act, amaze, amazed or amazing probably. Um, and what these numbers indicate is whether or not this particular term appears in this document. So I just have one and zero representation here. I could also use the frequencies instead if I wanted to. But basically we have a mathematical representation now of what we had before from the movie reviews and we can take that and just use our standard machine learning approach. Um, you know, splitting our data into a testing and training set. In this case, we used a 70-30 split. We used a decision tree uh, learner, which is a pretty straightforward classification method. As I mentioned before, you could use a random forest or you know, XGBoost or something more sophisticated if you want. NIME has nodes for that too. But we train a model, then we do predictions based on our test set, and then also again here, we can look at the confusion matrix. So you can see that our results from using the machine learning approach are quite a bit better, almost 88% correct if we look at accuracy as the metric. So it's just a different way that you could do it. And then finally, I won't spend too much time on the deep learning because as I mentioned, um, we're gonna have a completely separate webinar on this where you can really do a deep dive. Uh, but just so you know it's here, what I wanna focus on is this top portion here. If you use the Keras nodes within NIME and you wanna build a neural network, um, which is what deep learning is based upon, you can actually see the, all the different layers that are in the network and configure them individually using these nodes. So you can see I have an input layer here where I define the dimensionality of what's coming into my neural network. I have an embedding layer. Uh, I have an LSTM layer where I can set you know, my activation function. I can set initialization and regularization. These are all things that I would normally have to write Python code to do, right? But NIME makes it really easy for you to just point and click through uh, the dialogues to make your selections. And then you have this nice visualization of what the different layers in your network are. Um, I've already run this already. Uh, I trained this uh, on a non-GPU system, just my local system in probably 10 or 15 minutes, something like that. Uh, when I use the learning monitor, if I were actually training this live in real time, you would see these accuracy values scrolling by like this and then the, the graph would be growing. Um, but it's, you know, this is what the actual training looks like. And we can see that over time, the log of our accuracy started out fairly low. And then after a few uh, epochs and batches, it finally got up here uh, to a much higher accuracy value. This took, like I said, about 10 minutes on my machine. When I do the prediction here um, and look at the results, it turns out that the results are not quite as good as when I used the, the regular machine learning approach, but there's a reason for that. And the main reason, there's the accuracy is about 79%. The main reason is this isn't a very big data set, right? We only have 2000 different uh, observations here. If you're using a big data neural network type approach, you want a lot more data for um, deep learning to actually kind of take hold and grab onto something here. Uh, but we present it because I think it's a fairly digestible example of how you can build these types of models within NIME. And it's definitely fun to play around with on your, your local machine. You don't need a you know, huge cluster or anything. You can just um, download these workflows off of the hub and play around with it. So I know that was kind of a whirlwind blur through some of these workflows, but uh, Durson still is going to talk to you about something else here. So let me um, pass this off back to you, Durson, so you can talk a little bit about LDA in the time we have remaining. Thank you, Scott. Yes, um, let's talk about LDA, let me see. Um, again, another hugely popular application area of text mining uh, in recent years has been this topic detection, topic modeling. Can we automatically categorize, group, kind of segment the documents based on their hidden, latent topics? That's exactly what the LDA does for us. So LDA stands for latent Trishlat allocation. It's one of those relatively recent um, algorithms that does a pretty good job automatically identifying topics within a collection of documents. So the input 
is your large collection of documents. It could be articles, again, it could be reviews, anything, any, any textual uh, corpus. So idea here is that uh, there is this hidden uh, topics, the, the themes that can represent the documents which can itself be represented by a collection of terms. So the, the relationship between documents to topics is a uh, multivariate weighted collection. And then the relationship between topics to terms is also a one too many weighted collection of terms. So certain number of terms collectively with different weights assigned to will define and characterize a topic and um, a collection of topics will be related to a document where some topics are going to be more dominant. So compared to clustering, where there is a one-to-one -one mapping, the difference here is that there is one-to-many mapping. So it's sort of a, it would not be probably technically correct to call it fuzzy, but there is overlap between uh, the role that the topics actually play in characterizing documents and similarly role that terms actually collectively in a weighted fashion uh, plays to characterize and define the topics. Um, it automatically finds K number of topics, LDA does, um, and each of the topics will be dominated by N number of keywords. You can actually get to define as to how many topics that you want to find in a collection of documents. And you can also define how many top keywords that you want to see and kind of visualize at that point in time. <clears throat> so latent topics um, are the middle tier between the documents and the words. Um, it does not, LDA does not take into account the syntax or the order in which the words are presented in the document. So it's still a bag of word type of model. Whereas when you will see, uh, if you connect with us on the, the uh, um, deep learning, how deep learning and LSTM can be used for textual um, modeling, there you can actually take and take out the sequence in which the, the word actually shows up in the document for a richer representation and hopefully better uh, data extraction. The order of the document also is not important. The same word can belong to different topics with different weights is attached to it. So it would be a dominant word in one topic and not so dominant word in another topic. So the number of topics you have to, as the user, um, have to specify, specify ahead of time and it needs to be known, and that's how it creates the, so you can play with different number of topics and see which number of topics kind of generates the intuitive, uh, you know, label-oriented uh, topics out of the, the document collection. Now, just to show you a simple application of that, I'm gonna give you a, a short description of, of one of the most popular, probably most entertaining project, analytics project that I've been involved in for almost 18 years now, it has to do with predicting financial success of Hollywood movies before you actually produce the movie, before you spend a single dime on the movie project. Because any given time, a producer um, in Hollywood has large number of potential projects that they can actually spend their few hundred million dollars. They want to find the ones that are more likely to produce Profit because if you look at the the statistics, at best two thirds of the movies produced in Hollywood actually loses money. So it's it's a better than fifty percent chance that any movie that you actually invest in, you will lose money on it. But at the end, probably in a portfolio approach, the ones that actually makes money makes more than the ones that actually lose money, and you're still on the the, the green side of things, financially speaking. And that kind of is the fuel that that lets Hollywood to keep producing movies and putting them out there. So forecasting box office outcome before you produce the movie, there's a lot of testament out there, one of which is, 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 is in the slide coming from Jake Valenti, a long time, recently passed away, president and CEO of uh, MPAA, who actually manages the Oscars and, and so forth, tells you that, that you can't do that. It's, it's an art form. You cannot, you cannot 
predict the financial success until you produce the movie, put in front of the the uh, the audience, and then 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 see if audience is 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 willing to positively tell other people and brag about it, and and then that's how the the box office kind of builds up. But it turns out this particular research, uh, topic problem has been a subject of many academic research. Um, a lot of the pre previous research looked at behavioral models usually used, you know, if we can get the initial um, financial success of the movie, can we extrapolate what the, the complete financial numbers would be? And our approach was, let's use everything that we know up until the time when we have the project, but we haven't spent a single dime on the, the, the movie project. So looking at the, the, the large collection of data in Hollywood uh, movies for the last 10 years, and then probably the most creative part of this project has been how do you numerically and symbolically represent a movie, right? Um, what features do you include in a prediction model? And then that's where we spent uh, an awful lot of time. And these are some of those variables that we extracted, uh, the rating, the computation intensity of the star value, the genre is a totally different animal to deal with while representing the, 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 the structure nature of, uh, of motion pictures. And um, along with this, we actually kept adding more and more features to our prediction problem. And we wanted to predict whether or not a movie falls into one of these nine categories. So if it's category one, we call it flop, category nine, 200 million or more, blockbuster and seven additional categories in between. So it's a multi-class classification problem is what we formulated out of this project. And then we use a whole bunch of statistical models, traditional, because we wanted to compare previous studies. We wanted to use what they use. We also added a lot of the machine learning models, including some ensembles. And then our initial early uh, project produced about 56% accuracy, putting the movie, movies into the exact same bucket that they actually belong to out of the nine buckets. And we create this additional accuracy measure that we called one away, just to measure to see if we don't put it in the exact bucket, what percent of time we put it on the adjacent one. So when we miss, do we miss a little or do we miss a whole lot? So we wanted to also measure that. Now, what I'm gonna show you in nine is that I'm gonna show you how we can actually do prediction only using the storyline, right? It's a summary of the plot. It's probably a few paragraph long that tells you the very essence of what the movie is all about. And then the question here is that, is that enough pattern, enough information in it to use and predict to some extent the, the financial success of the movie? And then here, in the workflow on the right hand side, I have two approaches. One is the brute force bag of word approach where I convert uh, the terms to numerical representation. It's a very large sparse matrix, but I use that as an input and with a lot of features, each of which is a term that showed up in any of the, the story um, summaries. And then using decision trees to see what the prediction accuracy would be. Would it be any better than random chance? And then I wanted to see, can I actually use topic modeling, LDA, as a means for feature reduction, as opposed to using thousands of features columns? Can I just use maybe 10 topics uh, as my feature space and then build the prediction model on top of that. So I'm gonna show you on my workflow and you have access to this to play with it, is that at the top um, flow workflow, I am using the brute force, a uh, large um, collection of features, a sparse matrix, if you will. Uh, it's the document vector and you will get familiar with it if you start playing with the, the the uh, uh, text extension uh, in nine. And then let's look at the prediction accuracy of this. Okay, I was hoping that uh, my prediction of LDA driven classification model would actually produce better prediction results. In this case, my brute force approach produced somewhere around 18% accuracy, whereas 
my LDA driven and here is the note that does it all. It's a parallel LDA. It's a computationally efficient implementation of LDA. It's really computationally intensive um, algorithm. So it does require certain parallel processing for it to process large quantities of textual content. So what it does is that generates a document table. So these are my topics that I'm generating. I'm generating seven topics, okay? And the topic that has the highest weight for a given document will get to be assigned as the representation of that document. So the first document, first script summary belongs to topic number six, the second topic number zero. As you can see, each and every topic has some weighted uh, input in defining um, the very characterization of that particular document. So here, the largest value, the, the weight, is going to belong to topic number six. And winner takes all, it will be assigned to topic number six. Now, the second output that the, the LD will generate is the same or similar relationship between the topics and the terms and the weight that each of those terms assumes in defining and characterizing that topic. So you have topic zero, topic one, and topic two. If I go to, again, without taking too much time here, to definition of this, you get to define how many topics that you're looking for and number of words that you wanna uh, use for each of the topics. In this case, I picked seven and 10. And then these are alpha and beta values that are probabilities that defines the relationship between the documents to topics and topics to words. Okay, and then let's see if my hope and assumption was true. Um, it wasn't. The brute force actually generated better prediction results than the LDA-driven classification model did. I also did a visualization, TAC Cloud, and it's a Java-based um, TAC Cloud. It takes a few seconds to show up. So what's going to do is coloring each of the topics um, with different colors. You can change the representation of it to make it a little more um, visual. And then if you look at here, uh, for instance, greens, uh, father, meet, life, friends. So it's like a drama type of uh, movies, whereas uh, um, you have a war, human, force, mission, kind of patriotic, uh, you know, action adventure type of a movie. So, so when you look at this, this color representation of the topics, um, you will see some intuitive um, collection of, uh, of commonality coming out of them. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my slide deck. Um, and um, if you're interested in learning more about this project, it's an entertaining project. I use this constantly in my classes, in my presentation, because it's so easy to explain and so easy to understand how analytics do what, what it does. And although it seems very intuitive, it's quite complex because how do you create future space from a art form and then use it for prediction purposes? So we published a few papers on it. You will easily be able to access it. If you can, you just shoot me an email and I'll, I'll send you the papers. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to Scott to wrap things up. I think we're running out of time. And then we're gonna answer some, some, some questions. So let's take a minute here to answer um, just a few questions, uh, Durson. I had some marked for you. Um, there were a couple about LDA. So one was, how large does the document collection have to be to apply LDA? And then related to that, what is the best approach for interpreting the topics that you extract? Excellent questions. Um, as far as the size of the, uh, the corpus, um, in analytics, um, we say uh, bigger is better. Uh, use all the data um, on the face of the earth. But at the end, uh, if it's too large, then LDA is computationally intensive um, algorithm. Uh, although with parallel processing and multiple cores and everything, and you can actually reallocate larger memory to, to nine processing, uh, it will still consume a significant amount of time. So there, 
there needs to be a fine balance between too small to too large. Um, several thousand documents would probably be a good choice depending upon how large the documents are. So if they are tweets, you can go to tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, actually do some topic modeling using millions of, of uh, tweets because they tend to be a small in size. And then I use some specialized software and hardware to actually crunch through those kind of um, large data. But um, that really is not a good answer to it. Uh, larger the corpus, better topics you're going to extract, but more computational resource that you have to have in place for it to complete in due time. As far as the interpretation of the topics, you just have to go into each of the topic and the, the, the weight listed of the terms and, and then intuitively, maybe if you're not a domain expert, talk to a domain expert, a person who is in that particular feel to label them for you. It's not going to be 100% accurate or 100% coverage of all keywords kind of um, aggregated to a, a topic label that you can use, but um, is the, um, um, the visualization that I showed you uh, indicated, there often is um, a good collection of terms, dominant terms that collectively can help you come up with a uh, um, intuitive, understandable, well-representing uh, label for each of the, the topics. Again, there is not an optimal way of doing it. It's more of a, how much you know about the domain, uh, how can you actually find that uh, buzzword that can represent most, if not all of the keywords, top 10 or top 15 keywords uh, that collectively characterizes the topic. Scott? Yes, so let's see, a couple of other questions here, and I, we're, we're actually over on time, so let me answer these right quick. Um, one was how to handle mistakes, uh, spelling mistakes and uh, data entry type of errors. Um, that's a common problem, right? You have a dirty data set because somebody fat fingered when they were um, typing in their information. Um, if you're interested in doing that, one way to handle that is with uh, similarity search. If you search on the NIME hub, for the similarity search node. Um, there's ways that you can approach that using, using Levenstein distance to look at similarity between words or between strings. Um, and that can sometimes help you do this kind of fuzzy match approach. Um, so check that out. And then another question we had here is uh, about text in Spanish. Um, if I have Spanish text, do I need to translate it first or can I do it directly? Um, actually, no, you can do it directly. You don't have to translate it. We do have, um, language packs available in NIME for several languages, Spanish, German, French, um, Turkish, there's a few others. Um, so if you use, if you download that language pack, then when you do your document processing, like when you convert from a string to a document, for example, then you can use the, st the Spanish tokenizer instead of the English tokenizer, which is the default, um, and then just go about your business as you would regularly with text processing. Sometimes you have to be a little careful depending on what language you're using. Um, if you're looking at diacritics, for example, or if I had this happen the other day, um, if you're pulling information off Twitter, sometimes you have to be careful about the emojis are in there because the tokenizer doesn't like emojis. Um, so sometimes you have to do a little cleaning, uh, but it should be fine. You definitely don't have to do translation first to then do the text processing. That's not necessary. Um, okay, so since we're over, I, I see we've answered over 30 questions in the chat. Hopefully yours was answered. If it was not, we will be posting a topic on our forum, the Nine Resources Forum. Um, you'll see that in the coming days where we'll try to make sure all of these questions get answered. Um, and then even the ones that have already been answered will be listed there as a resource. Um, so with that, I will wrap it up to say thank you very much for coming. Uh, hopefully you've learned something today and we would certainly like to see you in our upcoming courses, whether it's for text processing or something else. Uh, come and say hi. Um, and in the meantime, happy niming. Thanks everybody for coming out. Thank you everyone for joining us.